very much, uh, my dear brother. <clears throat> Just to appreciate uh, my reflections, I think it's important to say where I come from. I grew up, born and bred in rural Uganda, so I'm truly a rural boy uh, in every sense. And uh, first generation, second generation Christian, because my father was one of the very first uh, followers of Jesus uh, in our village. So grew up in the church, Church of Uganda uh, within the Anglican tradition. As a young lad, gave my life to Jesus, socialized and discipled through Western models of discipleship, scripture union, the student movement. And so I truly imbibed Western forms of evangelism and discipleship. And I believed them wholeheartedly. And I committed myself to a life of service within those frameworks. Fast forward, I uh, served uh, within the student movement uh, in my country and beyond uh, Africa and, and preaching and teaching the gospel within the same evangelical, within the same structure, uh, within the same episteme. I was so passionate about this, and especially as it was reflected in the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship model of Abana missions, that I decided I would be one of those to create a similar movement across the continent. I was very, very passionate that we need to see Africans not only becoming the missionaries in Africa, but beyond. I actually thought this idea of reverse mission had a sense in it. Because you see, these Europeans and Americans are quickly becoming pagans, like we were pagans. Because they told us we were pagans. So now it is our turn to go and teach them and tell them about Jesus. I believed it. And so we created what you might call a missions movement, an authentic African missions movement, still a performance of the same models of evangelism that were given to us uh, by the West. About 20 years ago, I began a process of deconstruction, and I'm still on that journey. I am going to be arguing that this journey not only is going to question evangelism, the practice, we actually are going to question the content of that evangelism. What is the gospel in this evangelism? For Professor Sonchan Ra has certainly argued and articulated very well the necessity and direction of deconstructing and reconstructing evangelism practice. I actually take a cue from Ra's insistence that the task of proper deconstruction that leads to reformation of evangelism is to expose the extant diseased imagination and narratives that have shaped the theologically dysfunctional imaginations and narrative. I am actually persuaded that what Ra alludes to as the disaffection in the Western church, the disaffection from the church, Christian faith, and the apparent disconnect with the Christian gospel is actually an opportunity for us to interrogate not only the patterns and practices, but the very content of those patterns and, 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 and practices. I am suggesting that this actually forces us to ask and grapple with the primary question, what is the evangel? Or put it differently, who is Jesus? I therefore argue that the hard work of reforming evangelism requires that we first interrogate the conceptions, the conceptions of evangelism embodied, the conceptions of the evangel embodied in what he names as Western-centric patriarchal racially and culturally insensitive expressions of evangelism. I certainly conquer that deconstruction is a necessary expression of evangelism. I do agree. But deconstruction must engage the narratives embedded in the expressions of Christian evangelism. 
That is, the narratives that are the substance of what we have called the Christian gospel message. As I have argued elsewhere, I believe that it is critical that we make a distinction between Christianity and the evangel. For Christianity is not the evangel. The evangel is not Christianity. I am therefore suggesting that this process interrogates critically the nature of Christianity. In fact, we could even go further and say it interrogates Christianity itself as we know it, as a way to encounter and connect with the gospel. For you see, friends, the good news of the rule of God, of love, justice, and shalom, cannot be reduced to the religion of Christianity. I suggest that Jesus' encounter with the two on the road to Emmaus gives us a sense of appreciating both the distinction and the critical work we must do of deconstructing ways of understanding the gospel that have not only distorted it, but have clearly gone away and proclaimed an evangel that is further away from who Jesus truly is. What I would like to do in the minutes that remain is, first of all, try and reflect and have a conversation with Professor Ra on the definition, the hyphenated definition that he invites us into. Then after that, I will do some conversation with us, pointing us to the model I believe Jesus gives us in his encounter with the two disciples on road to Emmaus. And then I will illustrate uh, what I think this requires of us, I think about African Christianity, African evangelism. I'm actually suggesting that because centers such as Africa and possibly Asia and Latin America, but I know Africa most, that are celebrated as the new centers of Christianity, in fact, raise the question about the evangel even more. And so we too, where evangelism has quote-unquote succeeded, we are forced to ask and deconstruct that evangelism because of what it looks like. So first then, definition of deconstruction. I appreciate the direction that Professor Ra has taken us to, but the challenge that uh, Professor Ra has done for us is limit his definitions into the same Western episteme. I would like to suggest that possibly to enrich our this definition, we need to integrate epistemies beyond Western paradigms, which are rooted in histories and geographies other than the West. Here, we need to ask the question whether there is a rationale for deconstruction from geographies and histories for whom postmodern is not the defining narrative for coming to, critical, coming to grips with a critical need for deconstruction. Postmodern is an experience located primarily in the West, of course exported. However, there are histories and geographies for whom postmodern is not the defining narrative. And I am suggesting that once we go there, we begin to discover that actually we can be freed from the discourse of this hyphenated, the hyphenated distinction between deconstruction, deconstruction. In my mother tongue, I don't even know how to put it. We have no hyphens. <laughs> the matter of how language functions in embodying communicating the meaning is a matter of every culture. I like to take us to what I call, and others have, primal, primal cultures, primal appropriation of knowledge. These are language systems, these are language systems that have a different way of meaning making, meaning making. And I particularly make reference to primal as the thought patterns and perceptions of reality and concepts of identity and community prior to the encounter with Western culture, Western religion. Primal here speaks about the historical anteriority, that before, that which many cultures that are still connected with the ecology of the world uh, experience. And in this, what we discover is narrative story is not simply a genre, it is actually a hermeneutical, a hermeneutical structure. It is an episteme by itself. For you see, in our languages and cultures of understanding, a person being is a story. 
an embodiment of many stories, as well as person becoming in the process of encountering and making sense of new experiences. Here you see story and narrative should not be understood simply as a social or cultural activity of sharing stories of entertainment, teaching, value, skills, and so on, but rather as an episteme. For you see, who we are, how we self-identify, how we make sense of our location in the world are stories we have inherited, have been told, we tell ourselves, and we tell the world. We are the narrators because we embody stories, particular stories. Moreover, narration itself is part of the essence of personhood. Narratives, my friends, have so much power over us because they define our visions and our expectations. They are the greed and the lens through which we construe the past and imagine the future, by which we therefore make sense of the present, this moment, this place. They constitute the substructure of who we are, how we know, what we know, and our imaginations. Narrative as a structure of meaning making frees us from what Walter Minoro calls the hegemony of alphabet oriented notions of text and discourse. Social location, you see, friends, is meaning making and communicating. It is primarily about stories and narratives. However, stories and narratives are not of the same significance. Here, we want to reflect on what we call defining narratives. There are of three types, founding narratives. Narratives of telos would be the second that are called controlling narratives. And there are various authors that have reflected on this. And thirdly, what uh, Chris Wright calls the grand narrative. These are the ones we need to engage in. Deconstruction therefore entails uncovering and interrogating the underlying narratives which should lead to reconstruction. Narrative here is a hermeneutical structure, as I have argued, for unearthing the patterns of power, the patterns of power embedded in the practice of evangelism. Which better teacher, which better teacher than the evangel himself, Jesus of Nazareth? the Christ of God, to teach us the process of deconstruction. Hence, to Luke chapter 24 as a model of deconstruction, Jesus' encounter with the two disciples. We don't have time to get into this text. It's an amazing text, but it does many things for us. What does Jesus do as he meets this, some think it's a couple, these two? He listens to their version of their story that has constructed popular Judaism. It's not just them who hold this. The apostles later hold the same. This really is popular Judaism, which was grounded in the idea of the Messiah. So there is here a conversation about the Messiah. In a sense, a conversation on the evangel. For you see, the good news for the Jews, for Judaism, was encapsulated, captured in this idea of the Messiah. What is surprising is that the disciples can't see Jesus. They cannot see. They have a stranger. They are, in fact, surprised that he doesn't know the events that happened that weekend. More or less, haven't you watched CNN? It's all public out there. And Jesus listens to them as they tell the story of good news, good news that are structured within a narrative of a conquest, controlling, dominant Messiah, for which there was a long history, a long history. And as he listens, Jesus says to them, rebukes them, and says, how foolish you are. I want to argue that possibly this moment gives us an opportunity to hear Jesus say to us, how foolish you are. How foolish you are, evangelicals. How foolish you are, 
Presbyterians, Methodists, Anglicans. How foolish you are. How foolish you are. So this imperative for this construction is not just some academic exercise. It's very existential. How foolish we are. What does Jesus do? He simply shows them that the very basis of their despair, the cross, was the very basis of the good news of the gospel. The cross. For you see, the cross embodies different, not just different, radically different, radically the, the opposition of the power patterns of conquest and control. The cross as the embodiment of the message of the gospel. For you see, the Messiah the disciples expected, according to the narrative that created their imagination and hope of his kingly rule, was one who would come with superior power, defeat the Roman imperial powers, restore the former glory of Jerusalem and Israel as it was in the heydays of King David. It envisioned a world in which Israel was the dominant power, a kind of totalitarianism with one national vision of the world, a Messiah who would possess superior power, conquer and vanquish Israel's enemies, establish her dominance over the nations, and exercise in patterns of power that are characteristic of domination and conquest. Does this sound like what we are? Does this sound like who we are? Does this sound like this is what we think evangelism should achieve? Jesus said, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into glory? Any reconstruction we engage in must grapple with the idea of the cross. Did not the Messiah have to suffer? He reproached them for not only misunderstanding the scriptures, but distorting the scriptures. Not only misunderstanding the good news of the Messiah, but distorting the very good news. Jesus deconstructed the controlling narratives which centered conquest, domination, and violence, reconstructing it by centering suffering as the means by which God's rule is inaugurated. I want to suggest that that's what we are confronted with. For the models and practices of evangelism today are simply a performance of an evangel that seeks to conquer, to dominate, to, and the evidence is overwhelming. In fact, the work of San Chan Ra and Mark uh, Charles was extremely helpful for me to see this. The patterns of evangelism were established in the very early period, 15th century. The command by Rome, the Pope, that gave authority to these princes to conquer. The right, I quote, for conquest, sovereignty and dominance over non-Christian peoples along with their lands, their territories, and their resources. The template of patterns of power and power relations between the conqueror and the conquered was written then. I am arguing that that is what evangelism was understood. Evangelism as mission. Mission as conquest and domination. I would argue that that has not changed. The evidence is the story of African Christianity. For you see, African Christianity, Christianity has taken over Sub-Saharan Africa. Over 60% of Sub-Saharan Africa is reckoned to be Christian. But as Emmanuel Katongo himself, give me a moment, has argued the evidence is overwhelming that this Christianity, in spite of its massive growth, what do we see? We see violence, 
And Christianity is part and parcel of the story of violence of Africa. But it is consistent with the original patterns established within colonial conquest. The success of evangelization of sub-Saharan Africa by missionaries from Europe and North America from the 18th century followed the same patterns of power, of domination, of conquest embedded in colonial conquest. It is not surprising, therefore, that the churches planted were simply extensions of Europe and North America. We pride ourselves in being Roman Catholics. We pride ourselves in being Anglican, Lutheran, Presbyterian, and Methodist. Katongole names the challenge of Christianity in Africa thus. Christianity in Africa cannot provide the critical challenge to the political and economic illusions of post-colonial Africa because it nicely locates itself within the dominant imagination of post-colonial politics and economics in Africa and quite often reproduces the same patterns as in the experience that we know in the 15th century. Thus, while sub-Saharan Africa gives evidence to the resounding success of modern-day practices of evangelism, it provides a compelling case for the urgent need to deconstruct its underlying and founding narratives. What is evident is that the primary captivity of expressions of evangelism is not culture, but rather empire. The patterns of power performed by Christian evangelism are the same as those of empire. I therefore suggest what, what we must interrogate and denounce and maybe renounce is seeing evangelism as a performance of mission, conquest, but rather evangelism as witness, as Jesus commended to the disciples when they listened to him. Thank you very much. Thank you.